Hi, I'm Mike, and this is my mic. I am here with one of my greatest friends. So what's funny is like, I know you as Angie, but then like on your website and stuff, I'm like, who the hell is Angelita? I'm like, oh, I forget that like on my website, I'm Michael. I don't think you've ever called me Michael. Ever. If somebody talked about you and said, Michael did this, I'm like, Michael? Yeah. Michael. <laughs> Usually call me Gordita. <laughs> <laughs> what was the word I showed you? Um, uh go oh. bueno. Go bueno. <laughs> that's it that's gonna be the next uh my comedy special gord de bueno, yeah, and, gord and, de bueno. and what does that mean again chubby hot <laughs> that should have been the, that should have been the name of this podcast gord de bueno there you go it makes sense um it's what my wife always calls me um but no so <laughs> I've worked with you for years. We've worked some late shifts, um, shared dinner many times. And what's cool is you're one of the people in the industry that is also doing other stuff. So Angie uh, Mendoza, you are a director, a writer, uh, but you also, I know you because you are a video editor and a producer. So you've worked for some of the largest networks in the world. Uh, you've gone all over the country, all over the world, but then also on the side, you've been writing and directing uh, some amazing stuff. Your latest project, I'm not even joking, was my favorite, but uh, to also, I'm going to read your bio. So if it comes across corny, it is because I can't really read. But uh, you're a Mexican-American film director based in New York City. So I'm also Mexican. I'm Gordy Bueno. Uh, so I want to talk about this because your passion started with your father's video stores when you were a child. Uh, that was your film school. Uh, but I think one of your first big ones was The Last Light, which screened at nine festivals in four countries, including the prestigious New York Film Festival um, and the San Diego Latino Film Festival. And it's aired on national television. Uh, your one minute short, You Deserve It, which uh, showcases a Day in the Life of an Immigrant in the U.S. won the grand prize at the Moyet uh, Moment Film Festival, which is a big deal because I can't pronounce it. That's when you know, like, you made it. It's that level. I know it's, it's like champagne. Um, and then uh, your last project is Great America, which I saw that too. And that's been screening at the Manchester Film Festival and presented at Brick Foundation Summit in March 2021. Um, and the official Latino Film Festival. So you you literally are all over the place. And tonight you are here with me. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. And a little bit about, well, September 16th, it's screened at New York Latino Film Festival uh, with a Q&A, uh, Great America. And uh, Great America is also going to be screening at um, the Chelsea Film Festival on October 16th. So September 16th, October 16th in New York, uh, but they're both it, virtual, so. It will be out before October 16th. So people uh, will definitely have to check it out. I, um, what's, it, what's so funny is, I feel like we're so much alike where we're like bubbly and giggly and we love a lot of stuff, but then we will sit there and shit on movies. And then a lot of your films that I've seen, they're like serious and, uh, this latest one is deep. So how do you think, um, do you ever get something where people are like, Angie, where does this come from? Um, yeah, I do. Everyone wants, yeah, especially because a lot of subject matter is really dark. And you know, the crazy part of it is, um, oh, there's my there's my little boy over there. Children, so I have him. And my <laughs> husband just left to, uh, to visit for, uh, friends in another country and, uh, and uh, so this guy's bugging me all day now. He's actually at the airport right now. But anywho, so, <laughs> but yeah, uh, most of my stories, they're, um, they're oh, actually, and a little funny story about him. His name is Bodie, and he's named after uh, Patrick Swayze's character in Point Break. Uh, I, I thought it was going to be after, um, who was the, uh, the guy in Jaws, the sheriff? Brody. Oh, Brody, 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 Brody. way Brody. off. 
not a horror film action awesome directed by a woman as well Catherine Bigelow she's awesome but um yeah but uh, about my stories um yeah all, all all of the stories are really dark and people are like what the hell where does this come from like you said and um the sad part of it is uh all of my stories have been inspired by true things that have happened and a lot of times it's like a combination of things that have happened and uh or research that i find uh, on, on subject matter so like um the last light um is a thriller and then and, and uh it deals with like basically child on child violence and like it, it's real stuff and like really crazy stories that i've read and um and you know i always like wonder like how how does this happen when someone's so innocent like does something so horrible like where does it come from um so i just kind of like it, all of my films have been short so it's just kind of like a little moment of of maybe why or a just of the act to get people like questioning what's happening and like great america um i you know years ago when i started out i was actually um uh it, like um an intern and doing like uh ae work so assistant editing work and um i was working on a film called uh crossing arizona and it was about the minutemen so it was about vigilantes out in the desert in arizona and uh and so uh you know it, it, that always stuck with me been like reading up on on different things about it i realized there's a lot of groups popping up left and right and especially since you know the previous administration like there's a lot of groups that have been popping up and then um i kind of like delved deep into it and um and read a lot about this guy who went undercover uh, and recorded them and they allowed them to record them because they thought he was one of them, you know, and like there's like this crazy insight as to like the mentality and like, you know, uh, and even like the language and like how, like the things that they really feel and they say when they're really uncensored is so like that all that kind of like went into the story. Um, and then uh, the latest project that I'm working on uh, that is the one I just I showed you called the blue drum. I won't get into details, but that is also inspired by a, a real blue drum. Let's put it that no! way. No! <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. I don't want to I don't want to go too much into it because I want when it comes out, I uh I think this is gonna propel you. Uh I literally was like giggling with excitement when I saw it. But before we talk about like everything you're doing now, um part of this podcast is for people that want to break into the industry and like I feel like when you're younger, you don't really realize that it's a doable uh, career. And like um, everyone grows up wanting to be Steven Spielberg. And for some reason, uh, people stop. So I'm hoping one day uh, someone will hear this and be like, I want to be the next Angie Mendoza. Uh, and so I think this is great. I want to know. Um, so your dad had a video store, but it was not Blockbuster. No, Blockbuster put us out of business. Let's put it that way. <laughs> no, it was uh, it was actually two. Uh, it was a um, a few video stores, and uh, they were in the Imperial Valley in California, which is about two hours east of uh, San Diego, like going towards Arizona. Because uh, my dad is from across the border, Mexicali, and in that area, and uh, so he had a chain there, and it was uh, called Valley Video. It was. Uh, he actually started out with one video store in Mexicali, wanted to give it, giving it to his brother. And then he had two video stores in the in Imperial Valley. And then a, a place called uh, Video 2000 was putting like, <laughs> was yeah. Like, like, yeah, it was like the blockbuster of the valley, right? They were like- Video like, 2000. They were putting That's the funny. pressure on. They were putting the pressure on. And then, um, so he kind of was like, all right, let me get out before, you know, this starts to go downhill. Uh, he took all the videos, uh, all you know, all the inventory, and he took it to to San Diego, and we got first dibs on like the tapes. So we had like boxes and boxes of like VHS tapes, um, and like uh, yeah. And then he, like, what was it, ninety two or ninety three, is when he opened one in Chula Vista, which is like San Diego County, which is where I grew up. And like yeah, um, it I don't know, video stores to me are like. Ah, they still, it still hurts me that they don't exist. And um, even years after he went out of business, I went to the competition. I worked for Blockbuster 
And like, <laughs> you know, like one of my crazy stories, like, yeah, yeah. I was like, well, you're out of business, man. They're no longer the competition. So like, I was like 17, right? And I, I got, I got work there. Like one of my, one of my crazy stories was that one weekend uh, while working at Blockbuster, I watched something like 22 movies in like a weekend and like from Friday to Sunday between like the movies. So like at Blockbuster, um, so the movies were, the inventory would arrive on Friday, but they wouldn't put it out till Tuesday. And they encourage the workers to watch the movie so that like you can, you know, if people ask you about like what your recommendations are, you can give it to them. And so like, and on top of that, I think we had like five rentals a week and all the videos yeah. I had from my dad already at the house and stuff on the TV. Anyway, well, the big 22 movies. I don't know how I did it, like, but 22 movies. It was great. I, um, what's crazy is you've worked at your dad's and Blockbuster. And uh, at some point you've had, I think, Netflix on your resume. Mm, well, that's something I, I don't know if I can share. It depends on if you can edit it out or not. But, um, I can edit this out. Yeah, so I'll share it if it's out the, if they do the press release, um, so you can leave it in and then take it out. But yeah, so with Netflix, um, so I was selected. Actually, the Blue Drum script was selected as part of Nalip's uh, Women of Color Incubator, uh, sponsored by Netflix. So now, yeah, I have yeah <laughs> that on uh, yeah on the. Oh my God. This is a Mike's Mike exclusive. Uh, we are going on the red carpet live with Angie Mendoza here. Um, as much as I want to praise you for it, um, I want to put you in the hot seat for a sec because you've, you're doing a lot of these amazing projects and you're always casting. And I, I, I've said it time and time again, Another, you send me so many things to watch that you do. You go, Mike, look at this other thing I did. Mike, look at this other thing I did. Here's this other thing, just getting on Netflix, apparently. You've never asked Mike to be in, in the movies. Well, unfortunately, you couldn't play the 12 year old girl uh, that was in it, but uh, you know. You don't know, you don't know my range. That's the thing. You don't even. You, You're right. You, you need to give me a, I'll audition. Give me a, let me do a read. For sure, you're right. You're right. I'm wrong. You <laughs> next film for sure. You're playing next film uh, for sure. Rabbit. <laughs> you purposely write things that there's no chance for me to be casted in too. That's what I think. I don't think you're driven That's by like your storytelling. It's like I don't want to deal with Mike. All right, so this next one is going to be this woman uh, cleaning out her father's house. And I'm like, ah, oh, well, I can't. I can't be either of those. I, I, I legit was watching uh, your last thing that you just sent me. And I was like, there's two little kids in the one part. Can't be them. There's like the woman and the dad and the si I'm like, can't be any of them. Well, so, honestly, if you were in L.A., you would have completely been cast in it. But okay. we're not in L.A. We needed get a funeral guests and you would have been perfect. I could have been right I, in there. I, in the director's cut, I give a little speech at the at the funeral thing. You know, I say, hey, guys, we loved him. He was a great guy. He got handsy with me. Long story short. And, and, and then I get a spinoff. Then I get a spinoff. Netflix says, Angie, we like this little fat kid, the Gord de Bueno. We got to get him on the, we got to get him a, a Marvel series. I'm going off the rails here. Origin, <laughs> right. origin story, origin story. <laughs> origin story. Um. But I, I want to know, so going back, you loved, you were like that typical, uh, like it makes sense what you're doing with your career now. You were that kid that was home watching 22 movies. Um, do you remember, like, I was almost like tearing up when you're talking about like the aisles and stuff. It really is, unless you were there, I have such a... Um, a nostalgic love for like you walk through and then there was movies you never knew what they were and you knew the covers. And then yeah. I, I feel like you don't get that anymore. Um, is there something that you think as a modern filmmaker, uh, if you were to release something, is, is that something you'd be interested in? Like doing a cool limited release maybe of like, um, like a VHS cover? 
Yeah, that's awesome. I, and actually, like some of the, it's it, like there's a lot of fan art by like extremely like amazing, talented, like graphic designers that do that for certain movies. Like the certain movies just kind of like um, fit, you know what I mean? And, and like in the look. So like I've seen it for Drive. I've seen covers for yeah. it, it follows also was like perfect and like yeah dude totally and and to me and speaking of like like uh covers that you never movies you never watched but, but like you always remember the cover like for me there's this movie called I think it's called gothic and it's based on like this old like um painting of of an incubus uh like a little goblin incubus sitting on top of like a woman and seeing like like basically the cover art, like they copied this painting and it freaked the crap out of me. I'm pretty sure it's called Gothic or something. I'm like trying that. to look it up. I, um, yeah, I'll look it up too. Oh, <laughs> if, yes, that one. So I never saw this movie. I think in recent years, I tried to watch it and I only watched a little part of it, but that cover box creep the crap out of me and i loved horror movies but that one my brother would be like let's watch this one like, that was <laughs> so so gothic it looks like they beat lord of the rings with uh gollum he looks like a little gollumy guy i mean he's he creepy does. looking um we've had this conversation before i think because i forget what mine mine was like um there was something called rumple skills uh spill skin or whatever and it was like a horror movie and he's like a little goblin that we're so much alike with like, I remember all those like horror VHS, like Jack Frost, or uh, there's nothing yeah. better than a bad horror movie, but like the reference you just gave, like the cool uh, concept art for like, it follows. And and like, I, I watch a lot of your projects and read some of your scripts and it almost has that, um, that feel where it's like new, uh, it's, you know, it's not what you're expecting. So even I've known you for years and reading your last script, I was like, holy crap. Like um, some things come out of nowhere, which is cool because you're such a, a horror fan. So you would think, you know, maybe you're just gonna do some cliche stuff, but you don't. Um, so how as a, a director at, and writer, someone that does kind of everything, how do you stay away from those like cliches it, i mean it's really it's hard you know like you kind of fall into it like uh naturally because you're just so used to it right you're just so, so used to seeing it and when you're when you're in a situation where you're like not familiar or like um you don't write this style all the time um yeah it, it can be hard to, to it can be easy to fall into it right but I think like the biggest thing for me was like uh, thinking about it of like how, what would be honest and true to that person, regardless of like what would feel right. Like we can make something suspenseful. We, we can make anything suspenseful. You can make, uh, actually a friend of mine just posted a video about what it's like uh, to get water in the middle of the night. And it's like goblins everywhere. Like you can make any, getting water in the middle of the night super suspenseful, right? But like, yeah. Like, uh, it's just a matter of like, um, I think being true to like the character and the situation and, um, you know, like taking the influences that you, you have, trying to copy them, trying to make them yours in some way and trying to make them honest to the situation, to the character, even if it's like suspense and horror, and like you have to have a suspense of just of disbelief right because it's something supernatural and not everybody believes that and 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 you know and uh but but when you're watching a movie you're in it and this is the world and you have to believe it so um yeah i don't know i just yeah it's like i said it's hard um you know obviously you're inspired by everything that you've taken in over the years and and um and yeah i don't know being honest to the character i guess that's the only way i can think of like not falling into it. Yeah. But I feel well, like when, when you fall into the cliches, it's because you don't know what else to do. Do you know what I mean? Like you kind of get stuck and then you're like, oh, okay, well that worked here. Let me try that. And then it's not really true to what's actually happening in the story. It's like a lazy, quick resolution of it. Cause I, I mean, when we were working together, um, like you really do 
uh, your due diligence. So like you would come in with like a notebook and be like, here's what, here's like three different projects I'm thinking of right now. I'm doing research on this. Here's, and you would sit down and like do character development and you would do all these like writing exercises. And from the outside, I'm sitting there, I'm like, this seems like a lot of work. Just, you know, do some jump scares. <laughs> but like, I don't think people realize how much work goes into it. Um, so I, I guess what I want to know is like, how much work went into your career? So you, when did you realize you wanted to work in this industry? I, like I was probably 16, something like that. I actually started to, um, well, I, even younger because I wanted to be like, like you, we have the experience. I wanted to be an actor too. I wanted to be, you know, yeah, that's what I wanted to be. <laughs> ever, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a performer. I just love movies. I just wanted to be that and like, um, I don't know, Tarantino said once about uh, when you fall in love with movies, like you don't really understand what they are. You just know the only thing you can see are the people doing the stuff, right? So the actors, that's what you see. So if you love movies, you're like, I want to be that. I, want, I've I don't never, know what that is, but. <laughs> I've never heard that line from him. That's phenomenal because when I remember being younger and like, you know, it sounds cheesy, but the first time I saw like certain movies, I was like, I wanna, when I get older, I'm I'm gonna remake that movie. Or or like, I remember seeing My Girl, that was like the first movie as a kid. I saw it in theaters and I was like, my brother was bawling, my parents are bawling and I was like, this is too much for me. I'm gonna remake this movie. I thought like, as a kid, I could be in the Mighty Duck movies. Oh. Like, but after they came out, so like, I remember when Scream came out, that was right like when the internet was getting popular. So like I printed out the script. That was like when you could go online and you could type in like Scream script and it might be there. Like now you could find it, but back then you never knew. And Scream was one of the first movies where like the whole script was online. And I was like, I'm gonna remake it and it will be in theaters. Like I didn't understand about like lighting or anything. Um, so that's a really <laughs> interesting. That's an interesting uh, thing that Quentin Tarantino said, because I knew I wanted to be part of it, but I didn't know how. And like trying to talk to my parents who had no uh, industry experience. Um, so my parents like signed me up for like modeling. And I was like, I, I don't, I, that's, I'm getting like headshots done. I was like, I want to be like the funny fat kid in like, you know, a Disney show. Like, I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah, it, it, it's crazy. And like, I still don't, people still don't really understand like the separation. So it's like, I, I know like, uh, my dad, you, you know, he thought like, oh, just get into computer science. You could do those animation movies. Like, you know, like he, he's an engineer. So, and you know, engineering worked for him. It was great. Like he, you know, he came from like, uh, you know, really, really humble beginnings and like, um, you know, he went into aerospace engineering and, you know, he did pretty well for us, you know, and uh, so he thought like, oh, yeah, like tech world, you know, you you go in there, you know, you yeah. can probably make movies with that. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, a lot of people don't, a lot of parents, a lot of family and even counselors at school don't really understand, like they don't, they don't understand that there is a career and there's a path and there's different paths to it, right? And depending on what you want, and the thing is, when you're young and you like movies, like you said, we want to be actors because you know, like all you are about movies, you don't get that there's like you know a gaffer and a you know like an AC, like uh, you don't get that there's all these different parts uh, you know that are really important. You know, production designer, like, and these are all head of departments. Like, I mean, even going down the list, I mean, even a P, being a PA on a film set, a, a film PA. It is, can be a career because a good PA is really hard to find. You know what I'm saying? So, like, people don't really understand that there's thousands and thousands of people that are involved in actually making a movie. And there's different <clears throat> sections of making a movie. You know, there's pre production, there's production, there's post production, there's distribution. There's so much that goes into, into that. And, like, our world, where we come from, is marketing. You know, like, we're from marketing. So even after something's already made, 
it goes, you know, it gets licensed, like a movie gets licensed by Lifetime or, or History Channel or A&E, and we come into the picture and we make a nice promo, which is like, I don't know, for people that don't know what a promo is, it's a like a little trailer of a, either a show or a movie, but basically it's for a network. So it's the little 30 second trailer that you watch that is, um, you know, prom uh, promoting the movie or the show that's going to be on a, on a network. So that's what we do. We, we edit that. And um, yeah, like, I didn't even know that this was a job, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I, it didn't even cross my mind. So, and you know, so there's so many parts to it and, and, and then TV is one world and movies are another world. The, the lines are blending a little bit with like Netflix and now HBO. And yeah. Netflix. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's still, you know, network TV is one thing, cable TV. There's just so many different avenues to go and about. And, um, and I think when you're young, uh, you don't really know what you want. You don't really know what you like. Um, I think early on you'll real, you'll trust your instincts and in that if you are happy putting something together and being behind a, a computer screen and that makes you happy, like seeing the finished product that posts might be the right place for you. But if that, if you're, you think that posts is an avenue to production, it's not, <laughs> it's two different, completely like different <laughs> things. Yeah. I, you know, I, I love what I, I love editing. I really do. I, I like to tell stories. So whether that's like in writing or it's in, in, you know, in editing, I like to tell stories. So I enjoy it. But I did have once this idea that from editing, I could somehow go into production and it's just not, it's just not true. Not even in the same, um, you know, like company and not even the same network. Can you go from marketing even marketing posts to like you know a series editor you know what i mean like you know cutting yeah. an episode so it's like you know it's it's all different avenues and i think when you're young you dabble in them because you have the freedom uh, to do that you know what i mean and um and you're gonna work for free a lot you know we all did <laughs> you know it's it's a kind of industry that um uh, any art in general any sort of art people expect it to be free somehow. Yeah. And, There's uh, going to be a time where it's 4 a.m. and you're missing something that your friends are doing and you're standing there going, what? I'm not even getting paid for this right now. I am miserable. Uh, and you, you go through this thing where you start to build a skill set. Um, and then you're like, but like, I remember one of my first gigs was like steaming sweaters at QVC overnight. And I'm like, but even if I run QVC, it's not what I want to be doing. So then I, 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 I left and I was, I, I took an unpaid job when I was getting paid and health benefits from QVC right out of college. And my parents were like, no, you got to keep it. It's a good job. Like there there's longevity there. And I was like, but not for me. And then I started interning at like a public access thing, editing like live music festivals and stuff. And it was the best time. I don't think people yeah. realize that like, I don't know, like, like you were so distinguished in your editing career to then take a leap. It, it's like, it's nice. So I think a lot of people think it's like starving artists. You either have to be broke, you know, eating soup every night and trying to be a director. But I think you're a lot like me where it's like, we do well with our job and we also have this other thing that we're focused on that is becoming more of a priority, but you're going about it in a more uh, responsible way. Right. So do, right. Do you, like, oh, do you ahead, ever, sorry. do you ever feel any less like, a, a, you know, one of those starving artist directors? Like, do you ever meet people in the industry like that? Cause I mean, I'm not really, I know you from editing, but it's like you go to like cans and stuff and like meet all these people. They're like, oh, you also edit? Like, I would think it's, you're more useful. And as a director, it makes you a better director because you're like, well, I can see in the edit, I'm gonna want this. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that we're all a product of our experiences. You know what I mean? And, and, and I wouldn't change anything uh, because it, if I did, I wouldn't be where I am right now. And where I am right now, 
uh, even though I'm super stressed out because there's so much on my plate. You are like, always stressed for how I, bubbly I you know. are. I know. <laughs> I, I anxiety in the, in the Gonzalez side, my mom's side. We have a lot of anxiety. <laughs> so I'm always stressed, you know, but, but, you know, like it's, it's, it's worth it. And, and I don't know. I also thrive under pressure. So even if I'm complaining about it, like most editors do, uh, even though we're complaining about it all the time, like if it was, if it was easy, I don't think I would be. Yeah. It, well, we, what, what's funny is like, you've had such highs in your career, but I don't think people realize how much work goes into it. So like, for example, when you went to like one of the biggest film festivals in the world, like you had a project come up while you were there. So you're like juggling this dual life where you're like going to these panels and like talking about your, your stuff in the industry, but then you're like in your hotel, like trying to get work done. So like, yeah. I think people think, you know, oh, I just made this thing and then I'm done. But you're one of those people where it's like, I got the project I'm finishing, the project I'm working on, the project that's coming up, the two projects that are like, um, how do you find that uh, you juggle that without completely jumping out a window? I have no idea. I don't sleep and coffee. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's really crazy. Sleeping. Like, yeah. And the thing is like, you know what it is? Like you and I, we have a good ethic. And like, I think that's like, that's, that's everything. Like if you have good work ethic, like I will never, I will never, never, uh, not meet a deadline like if i have a deadline i need it i i don't i do what i have I, if i don't sleep for three days to meet the deadline like i will meet the deadline um you know obviously i try to make deadlines that are realistic right things happen yeah. though you know like and with that specific thing that ha occurred like um you know i i had this festival where you know i'm, I'm networking and you know i had a short that i wanted people to see and um you know, trying to see if I can make, uh, meet, make some contacts to like, you know, to work in, 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 on a film. And, um, but you know, I have my responsibilities. I have a client and, you know, they don't, they don't care about my, my side thing. Like everyone yeah. wants to be the only one. I promise them that they are, you know, like I will meet your deadline no matter what. So, um, yeah. I think that goes a long way. And that, and for people that are starting out, like, I learned the hard way never to fail on the deadline. You know what I'm saying? And like, uh, I, I, I did it once and never again. I was, yeah, you know, like <laughs> yeah. You learn. And, um, you know, and if the, anyone can take anything out of that, uh, from this is always, always do what you say you're going to do. Like, and that already goes a long way. Like, I don't know. And that's a great of, piece of advice. Yeah. 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 It's it, you learn. Everyone learns it the hard way, but you don't have to. Right? I'll tell you right now. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting is I, I found that I've most of my success has come from that as well. Like, don't be afraid to give a realistic deadline or parameters, because um, a lot of people are like, I want to look good, so I'm going to tell them I can get it done in an hour, and then it looks like crap in an hour, and then everyone's like, this guy. But realistically, you could be like, I'll get to you tomorrow morning or tonight. Like, I, I think people are afraid when they're first starting out. But just, you know, I always carried my first few years as an assistant editor, I would carry a, a notepad and be like, all right, what am I doing tonight? All right, these things. All right, who do I need to talk to? Hang on, say it again. Let, I didn't get it. Let me write it down. And people would be like, man, you like write down everything. And I was like, but you will not hear from me the rest of the night. Like, you know, as an, as a night assistant editor, you're the only one in the building usually. And you know, the, you don't want to be calling people all night. It's four in the morning. Like, Hey, where's this? Where's it? And they were like, dude, that's fantastic. Yeah. A nice half hour when you get in. Um, so hang on, I'm, I'm going off. I keep, we, the thing is with me and you, we could go off on stuff. Like, I know we wanted to talk about horror movies. I'm like, I, I, we need to just stick to your career this episode. We'll do horror movies another time because we could keep going. Then we could go on our favorite Indian food places. We get, oh it just snowballs. God. But we could talk horror <laughs> movies. It's going to come out in October. So we need to talk horror movies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, very real quick. I want to know um, for the people that listen to this, what are, uh, 
what are some of the hardest challenges that you have faced as a female in this industry? I think that's important to get out there as well. Uh, well, as an editor, I, I don't know, as an editor, I've been very lucky. Um, I didn't really have that situation um, or I didn't feel like that was something that was holding me back. Um, so, and I had a lot of support from other women in the industry, like in Pulse, I think there's a little bit more of us in edit, at least in editing. Do you know what I mean? Um, there's not a lot of us because they're always constantly looking for more. Right. But, um, but we do kind of help each other out. Right. And, uh, and like stick together. So I, for the most part, I've, I haven't had such a rough experience when it comes to, to, uh, to editing, but when it comes to directing, you know, I just think it's really crazy. Uh, I mean, there's a lot more women now um, directing and given chances, but just the idea that um, you could have like made an amazing uh, indie film and gone on to Cannes or gone on to, you know, these huge festivals and and done pretty decently in the box office internationally that um, like, or, or even have your second feature already that a man would more like, would be more likely to be offered one of these 10 poles, you know, and that's what was really happening. Like people with less experience being offered and really because I think that, I don't know, whoever was on top was really seeing them as like, uh, I don't know, like more professional. Harvey, Harvey Weinstein. Dude, yeah, <laughs> exactly. There was that. There was a lot. Of, there was that. You're like, I don't, I don't know who was on top, yeah, but uh, you know? he's but in. He, <laughs> yeah, he's not on top anymore. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, but even like in the big, like in Warner Brothers or whatever, like they were offering these movies to like these big temples, like the, like you know, superhero movies, like. Those are the ones that actually like pay the bills. It, I hate to say it like it, but it's true. Like most of these indie filmmakers that are like doing really cool stuff, um, they're able to do this really cool stuff because at some point they were offered that huge temple and they took it and they made it theirs, right? And yeah, so one now, for the, we always say as editors, one for the meal, one for the real. Exactly, exactly. And that's kind of what they did. But uh, for a long time, um, you know, you wouldn't see women being offered that. So um, I don't know how, I can't tell you how my career would be different if I were a man, because, you know, I'm not, and I, I can't say, because um, I didn't live it. You know what I mean? I live this and um, I don't, all I can say is that it's taken me a very long time to even be where I'm at now. And, you know, the first thing that I directed was I thought like, oh man, like, uh, it wasn't the first thing that I directed, but the first big thing that I directed was like a commercial with Victor Cruz from the New York Giants. And I thought like, oh, like now I'm going to have a career and no, like nothing came of it. You know what I mean? I don't know. I can't tell you that what the experience would be if I were a man. I don't know because I didn't live, yeah. like, I didn't live it. Um, there's always going to be that what if in my mind, you know what I mean? And, you know, add to that. Like, uh, you know, I don't know, being Mexican, how many, you know, Latino women are directing at all? I, I saw the numbers and it's like, it's really, really, really insane. It was like, I can't tell you what the number was right now, but it was like less than a percent of director of films that come out are Latin, Latina women or Latinx women, you know, so. Are there um, resources that you know of that if, there are female listeners uh, that want to get into directing. Are there any that you know of that you could share? There's a lot of, um, there's actually a lot of uh, like incubators and um, programs that you can submit to, but um, they're all very, very difficult to get into for sure. Like um, there's a lot that I've submitted to multiple times and didn't get into, but uh, you know, like- Story of my um, life. Yeah, so, so you know, you gotta, you gotta keep going, all right? You get stopped by like, I know AFI offers a, a workshop. Uh, it's called the, um, a, uh, what is it? Uh, directing workshop for women. And it's, you know, AFI is the, the number one school or conservatory 
uh, for filmmakers. And uh, so there's a program there, which is kind of like an accelerated uh, grad school, I guess you would call it, because um, you yeah. don't have full time. It's more like a, you spend about a month in courses, but it's about a year of your life that you're, you know, you're um, perfecting a script for a short and then actually shooting it and going on. And a lot of people that have been in that program have really gone on really far. I have not been able to get into that program on one day, but um, I was a finalist uh, twice. So I'm excited about that. But, um, and if you're, um, if you're Latinx and you're trying to get into the industry, NALIP is like a really great uh, organization. And like, um, they're the uh, National Association of Latin Latino or Latinx independent producers. Um, they support a lot of, uh, a lot they have a lot of incubators and they have a lot of different programs to try to help you like get you know to the next level and um like i'm really grateful to them like um i i just they've done so much for me and um i i i feel like if you're if, if you need that support uh they're like really like a good place a really good resource um and then there's a lot of different um organizations that are for women specifically um I think there's like the New York Women, uh, what is it, New York Women Alliance, I believe. There's a few groups. And there's also like a Women of Color um, uh, group, Women of Color Unite, it's called. It's also a bunch of filmmakers. So there, there's a few organizations out there that are really legit and they're trying to do their part. Um, but I think the ones that really help you or could help you with your career are the incubators because it's really hands on. You're like doing the work, you know, and um, yeah getting that mentorship but of course before you can actually get into the incubators you need to do this work on your own because you won't get into incubators if you haven't done the work it's uh most of these incubators are for people who have had at least one short already so you still have to do it like you still have to try to practice and practice as much as you can on your own and what you said about like trying to juggle or not uh, about doing a different path of not being the starving artist and everything in New York City, it's super expensive, you know, like you got to live and uh, and you got to work and you got to hustle like everybody in New York hustles. There's no one who just has like one job and goes home at, you know, five and then just relaxes for the rest of that. It just doesn't happen. It's New York, you know what I'm saying? Um, but thanks to my career as an editor, I, I was able to save money and with my side hustles and everything, put that money aside and invest that money in my career and by doing that like investing in my shorts so um that's like been a really good route for us like I haven't had to wait on a grant uh or um in the past like I'm really happy and lucky that uh this current film that I finished was uh through a grant because it's the first time I haven't had to spend my own money to make a movie like it feels really good um but uh but having that career and having um being able to put that money aside to advance your you know your dream is like really important and a lot of filmmakers don't get to do that i mean there's a lot of filmmakers that have the money to invest in you know like maybe producing it and shooting it and then they never finish it because there's they just don't have the funds for it so i don't know i think like if i didn't have my career i don't know that i could be making movies at all so yeah. Well, that's why I, you're very practical. So like, I think our industry gets a bad rap of like, you guys are dreamers or there's a, a, a kid right now listening to this where someone in their life is like, yeah, you're like a dreamer. But like, I want them to listen to this episode and be like, all right, uh, Angie liked this sort of storytelling. She was inspired by it, saved up, bought a camera. Like you are very hands-on. And you, you're like me where it's like, I, it's hard to rely on other people and sometimes you don't have the resources. So like me and you, you've come in and be like, I'm trying to learn LUTs. I'm trying to learn color grading. I'm trying to learn, we're, we, we, we like you and your husband will sit down and do like lighting tests. You'll do camera tests because it's out of survival. So the, you can literally do, you are now putting out your own projects so there should be no excuses for other people, I, especially now with like certain phones and stuff. Um, I really, you inspired me too, because you just sent me your latest thing. And I was like, 
I want to go back and do something fun. Like I want to, for my, my high school self, that was like, I'm going to be a director. And um, I mean, I would say editing took over my life. I love it. But I'm like, as you can attest, our day job is with all these different departments. So there's like the legal department, the talent, the programming department, uh, the creative directors. So people will change things or put in their two cents. Whereas what's cool about what you're doing is a lot of the times you have the vision and you have the final say. So is it a little bit more, it's a, it's more rewarding. Yeah. Compared it, it, to, yeah. It's rewarding, but also um, it is a good to have someone else tell you what's not working. You know what I mean? Because that's the only way you're going to grow uh, too. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I, Sure, I have final say uh, right now, but as soon as I, if, you know, like the goal is to make a feature, as soon as I have, I can make a feature or I have people behind me to make a feature, uh, it's not going to be like that either, you know? So I think our experience and like, you know, we take notes, we take notes, you know what I mean? Like, and, and we have to accept them like in our industry, right? And then when yeah. it's personal, obviously it's it's a little bit harder because you're not it's your it comes from something you work so hard on um, on your own and it takes a lot of a, it's an emotional toll. You're a writer too, and like it takes a lot from you to put it on the page. I think writing is actually the hardest part because that's the one that hurts the most, right? If you yeah. know, but you know, in our industry, we learn to take notes, we learn to deal with the notes, and and more than that, like we've learned to understand what the note means as opposed to what the actual, what the thing that they're actually saying. Do you know what I mean? That, you have it, to find like it's almost like um, you learn to decipher things. It's like hieroglyphics almost. You're like, oh, okay, I get it. Um, like just to, yeah. Cause sometimes, you know, you're working with all these different departments sometimes. And, you know, as everyone knows, not everyone converses the same way. Right. It's about, and it's also like, it's, I always tease about it being like finding the note within the note, right? Like, but what does this note really mean? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I see what you're saying. You're, because a lot of times the note, it, it, it's not like, um, this is what's wrong with it. And this is how you fix it. It's not that. Usually the note is, boil the ocean fix it like this <laughs> fix yeah. it like this and you're like but why and, and then you start to think oh they just don't like this you know what i mean like and and, yeah. and and like in writing for example like they're like oh maybe if this happens or that happens instead or blah 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 and then i start thinking like oh maybe they're telling me that because they don't they're missing a piece of clarity or something you know what i mean like Maybe something isn't totally clear. That's why they want me to change this part over here. It's not that this part over here needs to change. It's that this other thing needs to happen before this part actually happens. So yeah. it's, it's like reading the note within the note. And, um, and, and it happens a lot with us, um, you know, in editing. A lot of times we'll have like backseat editors, right? They're like, no, put this shot in. I put that shot in. And you're like, okay, but you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's not... Sometimes it's like they're maybe they don't like a certain character and they want to cover them up. And they're not telling you that. They're just putting this telling you to put these shots in and you're like, but they don't work together. Or yeah. uh, swap this bite for this bite. You're like, but I'm telling a story with these bites. If I take that bite out and put this bite in, it's a different story. And so I don't know. It's it's yeah, trying to decipher what they're actually trying to say is is yeah goes a long way and I think it helps in any type of uh department in any department that you wind up like you you were you were talking about writing like I think a lot of people they're like I want to make movies I want to do this that and that like I think writing is something uh that gets overlooked a lot because people are looking too far ahead and even someone like you that has had an amazing career I would think people would be shocked that you you still take classes, you're still, you know, attending seminars. And like, even myself, I go to all these editing conventions. I'm always trying to learn, talk to people. 
Um, it's not like in this industry, like you get to your position and you're done. Yeah. Um, so what is your, with that in mind, and for people that are trying to get in this industry, now that they know that, I want to ask you, what is your biggest goal in this industry? Uh, my biggest goal is to direct, uh, have a career directing feature films. And um, as I also would love to be uh, an executive producer or, uh, for a series that I would love to, that I want to develop and actually have like a script for it. So maybe, maybe um, with like a comic, you know, a coming of maybe, age, you know, you know, here we go again, just spitballing ideas. I love it. <laughs> you know what's coming for me? It's going to be dark. <laughs> <laughs> it, here's the thing, me and you, we're going to do something on uh, John Wayne Gacy. There you go. Done. There we go. Prequel. Done. Done. Origin, origin story. Origin story. You're going you're gonna to get Jack Black and I'm going to be pissed and I'm never going to talk to you again. Okay? Um, like, but the producers, they made me do it. <laughs> they said it's the only way it gets made. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I, I want to win the lottery and be that guy who's like, Angie, come on, put me in. Um, but uh, I, before I let you go, I know you're very busy. What, I got to have you on again. We got to talk horror movies, but wh who's your favorite director? Ah, that's really hard. That's a really hard question because I go this back is a two hour answer now. Yeah, I can it's, feel it. <laughs> two hour answer, but um, you know, there's of the big directors, um, obviously Tarantino is like great and everybody, I love him. But of the other big directors, I, uh, Christopher Nolan is just amazing. Um, and Denny Villeneuve, I love him. I, I, you know, I've been a fan of his actually since. Prisoners, which I believe is the second film. Um, Incendi, Incendi was his first, but I actually saw Prisoners first at the theater and I it kind of went unnoticed and I watched it so many times. I it, That movie, I still, I mean, it's funny because my composer like jokes about how, or I joke to my composer about how every single time I send him a cut with temp music, it's like the uh, score for prisoners. That's funny. I love the, <laughs> the look of it. I love it. I love that movie. I love everything about it. I love the genre twist, which is kind of like what I'm super inspired by. Um, you go into a drama and then it becomes horrific. It, it, it becomes like almost a horror film because it's really dark yeah. horrific, and gruesome, you know? And who, um, yeah. Um, who is one of your favorite uh, that people might not know about? Like who's the, who's someone that they need to look into if you could drop a name besides yourself, Angie Mendoza? Right. <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't know why in my mind they go hand in hand, maybe because they have such a big impact on me around the same era would be Gus Van Sant. And, uh, and Todd Haynes. Um, and yeah, so something about me that um, if you know me, you know, it's uh, I, other than the, like, I always grew up in the horror film section, obviously, uh, growing up. When I hit my teens, I hit the special interest section, which is basically all the coming of age or like uh, films that were like about, you know, like, uh, like, uh, like um, LGBTQ stories um, and or just like really weird LGBTQ stories. So like for me, Gus Van Sant is like, a, you know, like, you know, in, in that community, he's like you know, huge. And he made a movie um, called My Own Private Idaho with uh, River Phoenix. And originally I was attracted to that movie because of River Phoenix. And then I was like, this guy, this director is insane. Like everything is so weird and like surreal and like, and I just absolutely loved it. And Todd Haynes is another director in the in the in the same genre or style. And a movie for uh, from his that really like um, that really. Uh, wait, sorry, my dog's crying. But um, that really had a big impact on me was Velvet Goldmine, which was a movie that was like inspired by Bowie's life. It was like an imaginary story about Bowie, a character like Bowie, and a character like Iggy Pop, with like mixed of reality and fiction 
action and it's weird and it's glammy and it's awesome and I love those movies too so for me Todd Haynes um uh, and Gus Van Sant which are you know directors that have I believe both been nominated for Oscars as well for other movies yeah but they're Good Will Hunting awesome. he did Good Will Hunting, hunting yes. and then uh one of my other favorites he did was Elephant it was like a reimagining of the Columbine shooting. And it, it looks like it's all like one take kind of. It's really well done. Yeah, and To Die For, which was actually great because it's like, it's based on a true story about this uh, woman who seduced uh, these teenagers um, and convinced them to kill her husband. So it's like, he made it in this really dark and comic way, like, which is just so him. And I love Gus Van Sant. I love him. Yeah, the, it's funny the because movies, we, yeah. we do a lot of true crime stuff, yeah. you know, like our day job is a lot of true crime. And then some of your other favorite stuff is just true crime. <laughs> it is. Most of my stories I'm telling you, they're like true crime stories. Uh, yeah. But like well, it, it, they're inspired by it. they're like they're not the whole story. It's just there's an element in it. And then I run with it. <laughs> well, it makes sense that a lot of your favorite directors kind of have a nostalgic retelling so like quentin tarantino like in glorious bastards like hitler's in it um and then you have yeah like gus van sant redoing Ella, or uh, columbine um yeah so it's interesting do you think you'll ever tackle something like that redoing like a like remake a, a remake but kind of a retelling like even quentin tarantino with um once upon a time in hollywood like it's kind of right. like an alternate universe um, I think you'd be, that'd be it. Maybe I could do another scream. Maybe I it could right? go full circle. Right, right. Yeah, it could. Yeah, and actually, like speaking about uh, meeting, like because um, I know that's something you want to you. That's part of your your podcast as well. Like I met uh, Wes Craven uh, a few years before he passed away, and rest in peace. Yes, rest in peace. And he's just it was such a gentleman and. Uh, um, another reason I fell in love with like the horror film community is like that is uh, West, like Wes Craven and, and um, also Mr. Robert England, Freddie yeah. Craven. Oh. <laughs> yes. They're just like amazing people and like the, like they're just such amazing. And Tony Todd, actually now that Candyman is, the new Candyman is out, he makes like a little cameo or on his <laughs> I it's, love Tony Todd. But yeah, in terms of retelling, I don't know. Maybe, I mean, I, I don't know what, what I'm going to feel like down, down down the line, down the road. Um, I, I like what they've done with it. I think it's dangerous, though. I think if done yeah, well. It can backfire. Because even like for my favorite, Gus Van Sant, um, he did uh, a remake of Psycho. and. Um, oh, yeah. Mm. And so is, then is that the one with Vince Vaughn? yeah. We don't talk about that one. <laughs> yeah. What's funny? <laughs> What's <laughs> yeah? We don't. Uh, yeah, that one never happened. What I'm saying, it can be very dangerous. Yeah. Um, even with uh, uh Luca Wall, like the you know, he's a new that not new director, but director I love. That's a current director, like doing a lot of stuff. He did Call Me by Your Name, so he did the remake of Suspiria. And it's like I said, it's it's dangerous ground because it can go really, even if it's amazing, you're always going to be compared to the original. And yeah. like, it's really difficult to be better than the original unless people have forgotten the original. For example, The Thing by John Carpenter. Or The Blob. The Blob was very good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Even the, like, yeah, I mean. Wicker was, Man. Wicker Man, <laughs> of course. The next Karate Kid, all oh the greats. My God. But then we have, you know, Cobra Kai, which is freaking Co awesome. Because they, oh. I, Cobra Kai is the best recipe for the nostalgia. It hits all the the milestones of what I want as an old fan from the '80s. But it's also new, where like you know, a, a 15 year old kid could watch it. Like it, it. It really is a show for you, your grandma, your kids. Like, it's awesome. Um, before we wrap up, on the hot seat, what's your favorite horror? What's your scary favorite? I messed it up. <laughs> God. This, I'm trying. This is my casting tape for you, and I messed it up. Now I'm never getting casted. All right. What's your favorite scary movie, Angie? 
the classic The Exorcist. It is the best horror movie there is. I always tell the story I watched it when I was six years old. <laughs> My parents were very young parents. <laughs> I don't <told> think, <laughs> yeah, The Exorcist is a movie where I remember being in like, early middle school and like my friends and I, we would like just walk through Blockbuster and my buddy's like, we should watch The Exorcist. And uh, my mom, it was my mom. And I, she was like, no, like that movie messed me up. And I was like a teenager. And I remember like giving her a lip about it. And she goes, okay, let's get it. And then it did not end well. Like me and my one buddy watched it. And the next day I was like, why would you let me watch that? Like that, that I, I'm not okay. And she was like, I told you, and you didn't listen. So now you'll learn to listen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a good lesson. It was a good lesson. No, it's crazy. Like I had the, we had the movie and I had it, you know, I, I knew it really, really well because it was one of the videos that we kept, you know, we watched it a lot. The Thing and The Exorcist were like on heavy rotation. Now, those are my dad's movies. And Tombstone, because he loves Kurt Russell. So you know, <laughs> those were on a heavy rotation in our household, right? But when when the when I was in college, the uh, uh, like the director's cut came out, it was the first time in at 10 years, maybe, that I was truly terrified again. Because I had no idea what was coming what was going to happen you know what I mean so yeah I felt like I felt when I was a kid and it was an amazing feeling I, and I miss that I, I miss that in movies I don't get it that often and that movie is te truly terrifying it's it's great and, yeah uh, that's and quiet and th that's what makes it more scary I think yeah which like you we were talking earlier about how it's kind of a drama that shifts Cause you're like, wait, what's going on with this kid? Is she being abused? Like you really, and then all of a sudden it's like, I, I, I. you're like, what the, oh my God. There's a lot of uh, twists and turns. Um, yeah. But thank you for being on the podcast. We, I definitely got to have you back on cause we could talk about movies all day. Um, I guess last rat, if we want to go over um, any big thing if you have coming up or uh, if you want to give your social media or anything, people can follow you. Or if someone has a question, a young aspiring filmmaker, I'd rather them reach out to you than me. <laughs> no, <laughs> reach out to both of us. Yeah, my so my name again, Angie Mendoza or Angelita Mendoza. And my Instagram is probably the best way to contact me. It's at A-N-G-E-M-D-Z-A. So Angie Mendoza basically without any of the vowels but um and uh yeah so coming up um my film green america is in the festival circuit uh it's going to be at the chelsea film festival um in new york uh but virtually on october 16th and um after that i'm finishing up the blue drum which hopefully will be starting uh the festival circuit uh next year so uh, the horror film we were talking about. So yeah, uh, you know, follow me and you can follow also um, at the blue drum um, on Instagram and you should get, see updates about where it's gonna be screening um, and, you know, uh, more information about it and pictures. And pictures of Bodie and all the fun festivities you guys do. I know uh, you go up to the Mahoning Valley Drive-In for all these fun weekends um, and you're all over the world. So, but tonight you were here with me and uh, hopefully before the new year, we got to get together and get dinner and argue about what movie is the worst. Um, Sounds good, perfect. All right, thanks Angie, good seeing you. Go to MikeSalonaComedy.com. Uh, I got a bunch of dates coming up. You can check out my albums, The Do Not Call List and Calzone Farm, available now on most streaming platforms. You can watch Calzone Farm on Amazon. And uh, hopefully in the future, you could see me in one of Angie's movies, for the love of God. I don't think Angie's got, Angie hasn't gone to MikeSalonaComedy.com and seen my range. This is what's crazy. Like we used to eat lunch together every day. 
I know, I know. And then I, I, I didn't talk to you since COVID. And then all of a sudden I get this beautiful little email saying, Mike, you are the most talented person I know. I have a new short film I'm working on. And since you are the best person I've ever worked with, I need exactly to know what it said. <laughs> you said, not only are you the sexiest man I've ever worked with, right. you got the voice of an angel, uh, the best editor, hands down. And I said, I got to help Angie, but 